The Master Mason's Handbook by J.S.M. Ward Author's Preface The third degree in Freemasonry is termed the sublime degree, and the title is truly justified. Even in its exoteric aspect, its simple yet dramatic power must leave a lasting impression on the mind of every candidate. But its esoteric meaning contains some of the most profound spiritual instruction which it is possible to obtain today. Even the average man, who entered Freemasonry with little realization of its real antiquity and elaborate symbolism, cannot fail to be impressed with the solemnity of this, its greatest degree. In its directness and apparent simplicity rests its tremendous power. The exoteric and esoteric are interwoven in such a wonderful way that it is almost impossible to separate the one from the other, and the longer it is studied, the more we realize the profound and ancient wisdom concealed therein. Indeed, it is probable that we shall never master all that lies hidden in this degree, till we, in very truth, pass through the reality of which it is an allegory. The two degrees which have gone before, great and beautiful though they be, are but the training and preparation for the message which the third degree holds in almost every line of the ritual. Here at length we learn the true purpose of Freemasonry. It is not merely a system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols, but a great adventure, a search after that which was lost. In other words, the mystic quest, the craving of the soul to comprehend the nature of God and to achieve union with him. Different men vary greatly. To some, the most profound teachings appeal, while to others, simpler and more direct instructions is all that they crave. But there is hardly a man who has not, at some time or other, amid the turmoil and distraction of his material world, felt a strange and unaccountable longing for knowledge as to why he was ever sent here, whence he came, and whither he is wending. At such times he feels like a wanderer in a strange land, who has almost forgotten his native country, because he left it so long ago but yet vaguely realizes that he is an exile and dimly craves for some message from that home which he knew of yore this is the voice of the divine spark in man calling out for union with the source of its being and at such times the third degree carries with it a message which till then perhaps the brother had not realized the true secrets are lost but we are told how and where we shall find them the gateway of death opens, and the way to the point within the circle, where the longing spirit will find peace in the arms of the Father of all. Thus it will be seen that the third degree strikes a more solemn note than even that of death itself, and I have endeavored in this little book to convey in outline some part at least of this sublime message. As in my previous books, I freely confess that I have not converted the whole ground. Not only would it be impossible to do so in a book of this size, but in so doing, I should have defeated one of my principal objects in writing it, namely, to inspire others to study for themselves and endeavor to find in our ceremonies further and deeper meanings. The success of the earlier books show clearly that my efforts have not been in vain, and that the brethren are more than anxious to fathom the inner meanings of the ceremonies we all love so well. This book completes the series dealing with the meaning of the three craft degrees. But their popularity has convinced me that the experiment of producing a small and inexpensive handbook has been completely justified. I have therefore been encouraged to write further volumes, and since the value of our teachings depends largely on the antiquity of our order, the next volume of the series will be an outline history in which I shall endeavor to prove that Freemasonry is, as it claims to be, from time immemorial. In conclusion, I would add that the title of the work has been changed from the Master Mason's Handbook to the Master Mason's Book as I find there already exists a book published by Messrs. George Kenning entitled The Master Mason's Handbook, which gives useful, practical information to members of our order. Though the subject matter of the two books differs completely, yet it would obviously be unfair and misleading if, in view of their previous use of the title, I also employed it. Signed, J.S.M. Ward The sun is like the spark of fire, a transient meteor in the sky. The soul, immortal as its sire, shall never die, shall never die. Introduction by Sir John Cockburn Worshipful Brother Ward has lost no time in supplying his large circle of readers with his little book on the third degree. With becoming reverence, he touches on the last great lesson which Masonry presents to the mind of the craftsman. Among the manifold blessings that Freemasonry has conferred on mankind, none is greater than that of taking the sting from the death and robbing the grave of victory. No one can be called free who lives in dread of the only event that is certain in his life. Until emancipated from the fear of death, he is all his life long subject to bondage. Yet how miserably weak is this phantom king of terrors who enslaves so many of the uninitiated. As Francis Bacon remarked, there is no passion in the mind of man that does not master the dread of death. Revenge triumphs over it, love slights it, honor a spirit to it, grief fleeth to it. 
death has always been regarded as elucidation of the great mystery. It was only at the promise of disillusion that the seeker after the elixir of life exclaimed, Eureka! Masonry regards death but as the gate of life, and the master mason learns to look forward with firm but humble confidence to the moment when he will receive his summons to ascend to the Grand Lodge above. Brother Ward very properly attaches much significance to the passwords leading to the second and third degrees. In the Illusion Mysteries, an ear of corn was presented to the Epitai. This, as an emblem of Ceres, represented by the Senior Warden, is appropriate to the fellow crafts, who are under the guidance of that officer. While the name of the first Artisopher in Metals, which is reminiscent of Vulcan, the Celestial Blacksmith, seems specially befitting to the attributes of the Junior Warden, as it was in the days before 1740. The author sees in his lozenge, formed by the two great lights, a representation of the Vesica Pieces. This symbol, whose literal meaning is the bladder of a fish, is of deep significance. Some see in it the essential scheme of the ecclesiastical architecture, but as the spiritually blind are unable to discern similitudes, so those who are gifted with deep insight are apt to overestimate analogies. The Vesica Pieces being, as Brother Ward rightly states, a feminine emblem and therefore one-sided, can hardly represent the equilibrium attained by the conjunction of the square and compasses. These respectively stand for the contrasted correlatives which pervade creation, and, like the pillars, are typical when conjoined of the new stability resulting from their due proportion in the various stages of evolution. The progressive disclosures of the points of the compasses seem to indicate the ultimate realization of the spirituality of matter, the atonement and reconciliation at which Freemasonry and all true religions aim. Brother Ward repeatedly points out the similarity that exists between the lessons of Christianity and of Freemasonry. It is indeed difficult to distinguish between them. The ancient mysteries undoubtedly possessed in secret many of the truths proclaimed in the Gospel. St. Augustine affirms that Christianity, although not previously known by that name, had always existed, whereas the hope of immortality was formerly in the mysteries confined to a favored few. The new covenant opened the kingdom of heaven to all the believers. Incidentally, this little volume clears up many passages which are obscure in the ritual. For example, there could be no object in directing that the fellow crafts, who, on account of their trustworthiness, were selected by the king to search for the master, should be clothed in white to prove their innocence. That was already beyond question. The order was evidently meant for the repentant twelve who took no actual part in the crime. This and similar inconsistencies in the ritual may be accepted as evidence of its antiquity. Had it been a modern compilation, such contradictions would have been studiously avoided. It is probable that many earnest Masons may not agree with all of Brother Ward's interpretations, nor can such unanimity reasonably be expected. Freemasonry, as a gradual creation of the wisdom of ages immemorial, bears traces of many successive schools of thought, but all of its messages are fraught with hope for the regeneration of humanity. The author intimated his desire in this series of handbooks to lead others to prosecute the study of Masonry for themselves. And indeed, he has abundantly proved that in its unfathomable depths, there are many gems of priceless ray serene, which will well repay the search. Brother Ward is heartily to be congratulated on having attained the object he had in view. Signed, John A. Cockburn. Chapter 1. Questions and Password. Those of our brethren who have read the previous two books of this series will not need much help in understanding the significance of the questions which are put to the candidate before being raised. Practically every question has been dealt with in detail in the previous book. The majority of them are taken from incidents in the lectures and tracing board, and since the latter was explained at some length, we shall not now detain our readers long. The manner of preparation for the second degree stressed the masculine side, which is characteristic of it. The admission on the square indicated that the candidate had profited by the moral training received in the first degree, and that his conduct has always been on the square. We have in the last book considered at such length what is implied by the words hidden mysteries of nature and science, that we need here only refer our readers to that section wherein we saw that in the former times these hidden mysteries undoubtedly referred to certain occult powers, which would be dangerous if acquired by a man who had not proved himself to be one of the highest moral character. The wages we receive consist of the power to comprehend the nature of God, who resides in the middle chamber of the soul of every man. The fellow craft receives his wages without scruple or diffidence, because the spiritual benefit he receives from Freemasonry is in exact proportion to his desire and ability to comprehend its inner meaning. He cannot receive either more or less than he has earned, for if he has not understood the profound lesson of the divinity within himself, naturally he cannot benefit by this fact. His employers are the Divine Trinity, 
of whom justice is one of the outstanding attributes. God could not be unjust and remain God. This conception is almost a platitude, but the average man, while realizing that God will not withhold any reward earned, is at times apt to assume that because God is love, he will reward us more than we deserve. This is clearly a mistake, for God could not be partial without ceasing to be God. Therefore, the fellow craft receives exactly the spiritual wages he has earned, and neither more nor less. But some fellow crafts will nevertheless obtain a greater reward than others, because spiritually they have earned it. The significance of the names of the pillars was explained in the last book, but in view of the nature of the third degree, it seems advisable to point out once more that their secret Kabbalistic meanings is 1. Being fortified by every good moral virtue. 2. You are now properly prepared. And 3. To undergo the last and greatest trial which fits you to become a Master Mason. Thus we see that even the words of the preceding degrees lead up to this, the last and greatest. The remark of the worshipful master that he will put another question if desired, as in the former case, indicates the possibility of members of the lodge asking questions based on the lectures of the second degree, or even on the tracing board. It is, indeed, a pity that this right is practically never exercised. For example, a particularly appropriate question would be, what was the name of the man who cast the two great pillars? As it is, the candidate, in a dramatic way, represents the closing incidents in the life of this great man, whose importance till then he had hardly any opportunity of realizing. Having answered these test questions, the candidate is again entrusted with the password, etc., to enable him to enter the lodge after it has been raised to the third degree during his temporary absence. We have in the previous book explained that the raising of the lodge should alter the vibrations of those present by a process well recognized in the ceremonies of magic, and to enable the candidate quickly to become in tune with these higher spiritual vibrations. A word of power is given to him, which in a moment places him on the same plane as the other members of the lodge. This word he has to give, not only outside the door of the lodge, but also immediately before his presentation by the senior warden, as properly prepared to be raised to the third degree. It is only after this has been done that the real ceremony of the third degree, so far as the candidate is concerned, begins, and therefore that the full force of the vibrations of the Master Masons come into play. The password itself is of the greatest significance, more especially when combined with the password leading from the first to the second degree. At one time the passwords were reversed, Tubalcane being the word leading to the second, and Shibboleth the word leading to the third. This is still the case in those foreign grand lodges, such as the Dutch and the French, which derived from us before 1740, when the words were altered owing to certain unauthorized revelations. This alteration was one of the just grievances which brought about the succession of the so-called ancients who charged Grand Lodge with altering the ancient landmarks. When the Irish followed our example, they continued the prohibition of the introduction of metals until the third degree, which is a logical procedure, for clearly you have no right to bring them into a lodge until you have been symbolically introduced to the first artificer in the material. As the words now stand, they convey the following spiritual lesson. The fellow craft is one who finds the simple necessities of life, such as corn and water, sufficient for his requirements. They are plenty to the spiritually minded man, whose soul becomes clogged and hampered by the acquisition of worldly possessions. And since it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, immediately the candidate has symbolically received worldly possessions, he is slain. Tubal Cain conveys the lessons that worldly possessions in themselves bring death to the soul and prevent its upward progression. Today, the river of death connected with the password leading to the second degree has largely lost its significance, whereas when it was a password leading to the third, it was in itself a fine allegory. We must remember that Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress was well known and widely read at the beginning of the 18th century, and those who were reorganizing our rituals at that time could not have been blind to the similarity of the allegory hidden in the word shibboleth, and the account of Bunyan's Christians fording the river of death on the way to the holy city. The change of about 1740 destroyed this allegory, and its survival in the tracing board is now merely one of those numerous footmarks which to the careful student are invaluable indications of the various transformations through which our ritual has passed during the course of its years. Nevertheless, I do not regret the change, as I think the present spiritual lesson is even finer than the former one. But the other arrangement was more logical. Firstly, from the practical point of view, the fellow craft required the use of metal tools to perform his operative tasks, and in the process of his work acquired worldly possessions in contradiction to the EA who did only rough work and received only maintenance, for example, corn, wine, and oil. Secondly, from the symbolical standpoint, the sequence was also more logical, for the fellow craft, having acquired wealth by means of his skill, was brought to the river death and passed through it in the third degree. According to Brother Sanderson, in his examination of Masonic ritual, the actual translation of the Hebrew word shibboleth 
is an ear of corn or a flow of water, hence the manner in which it is depicted in the fellow craft's lodge, while the word tubalcane in Hebrew means only blacksmith, though another word similarly pronounced means acquisition. Hence, as he points out, an allegorical title has, in translating the Old Testament, been mistaken for the name of an actual person, for the name itself means a worker in metals. Therefore, the connection with Hiram of Beef is obvious. Brother Sanderson quoting from The Secret Discipline by S. L. Knapp says, In a work on ancient ecclesiastical history, the following occurs. A singular classis lingue. The moderns have substituted Tubalcane in the third degree for Timbuksane, or to be entombed. While I am unable to say whether Knapp is justified in the statement, it is quite probable that this password, and indeed all of the passwords, are comparatively modern substitutes taken from the Bible to replace ancient words of power whose full meaning was lost, and whose form in consequence had become corrupt and unintelligible. The Greek word Timbuksin would be peculiarly suitable for a password leading to the third degree in view of its meaning and medieval magic ceremonies are full of corrupt Greek words and indiscriminately mingled with equally corrupt Hebrew and Arabic. There is, therefore, nothing intrinsically improbable in the suggestion that this ancient Greek word was the original from which Tubalcane has evolved. We know as a fact that large pieces of biblical history were imported wholesale into our rituals in the 18th century, and what more likely than the unintelligible word, already so corrupt as not even to be recognizable as Greek, should be amended into well-known biblical character. However, the word as it stands, because of its Hebrew meaning of acquisition, can correctly be translated as worldly possessions, while as meaning in Artisifer and Metals it clearly refers to Hermabeef, who made the two pillars and whom the candidate is to represent. Thus, following this line of interpretation, we perceive that the candidate really represents Hermabeef when he enters the lodge, although under the disguised title conveyed by the password. In dealing with these passwords, I have endeavored to show that there are meanings within meanings, and the same is true of practically every important incident in the whole ceremony. In a book of this size, it is obviously impossible to attempt to give all of those meanings. And even if one did, the result would be to befog the young reader, and so prevent him from getting a clear and connected interpretation of the ceremony. It is for this reason that, in the main, I am concentrating on one line of interpretation, but I have thought it desirable in this section to give a hint to more advanced students, so that they can follow up similar lines of investigation for themselves. Preparation In English and Scotch working, there is no cable toe around the candidate in preparation for the third degree. But in the Irish working, it is wound once around his neck, in the second degree, twice, and in the first, three times. If we regard the cable toe as symbolizing those things which hamper a man's spiritual progress, the gradual unwinding of it, as used in the Irish workings, becomes of great significance. This interpretation implies that the candidate is hampered in body, soul, and spirit in the first degree, whereas by the time he has reached this point in the third degree, body and soul have triumphed over the sins which peculiarly assail him. And in that stage, symbolized by the degree itself, the spirit has only to triumph over spiritual sins, such as spiritual pride. With this exception, the manner of preparation is the same in all three British workings, and indicates that the candidate is now about to consecrate both sides of his nature, active and passive, creative and preservative, etc., to the service of the Most High. The explanation already given in the previous books of the various details, such as being slipshod, behold, the explanation given in the previous books of various details, such as being slipshod, holds here. And a brief glance at the other volumes will render it unnecessary for me to take up valuable space in this third book. The candidate is then brought to the lodge door and gives the knock of the fellow craft. These knocks indicate that the soul and body are in union, but the spirit is still out of contact whereas the proper knocks of a master mason indicate that the spirit dominates the soul and is in union with it, the body having fallen away into insignificance. It will be remembered that in the first book of this series, I pointed out that the three separate knocks of the entered apprentice symbolize that in the uninitiated man. Body, soul, and spirit are all at variance. Meanwhile, the lodge has been raised to the third degree by a ceremony whose profound significance demands consideration in a separate chapter. 